the sermon for April the 7th. The filming didn't go well in church this morning, so we're trying it again here at my house. I am enjoying the spring. You know, the cherry blossoms have begun to bloom and the daffodils are pushing their way up from the earth. There's so much promise of the warmer summer days to come. Soon the hyacinth will be shedding their fragrance with all passers-by. Have you ever stopped to think how aromas can trigger memories? My favorite smell is the smell of warm pine trees. I used to spend my summers cottaging in Georgian Bay, Ontario, and we would hike across the pink granite rocks, searching for the blueberries growing in the moss under the pine trees. Other days were spent splashing along the lake shore and building sand castles. In the evening, in the evening, we would pretend that we were orchestrating the sunsets, throwing out the yellows and oranges and mauves, seeing who could make the best sunset. Whether it was the day or the night, always on the gentle breeze was the smell of warm pine trees. So what is your favorite aroma? Is it the slightly salty smell of waves crashing on the beach? Is it the tang of Old Bay? Now, I, my husband would say it's the smell of a new car. But what's your smell? Is it your wife's favorite perfume or your husband's aftershaves? And what memories does that evoke for you? In this morning's scripture, a strong scent created strong emotions in the people who surrounded Jesus. We read that Jesus was at the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. He was on the move again, this time towards Jerusalem for the Passover festival. Masses of people were on the move. It was overcrowded. It was a no room at the inn kind of event. And so this house in Bethany was a good place for Jesus and his crew of disciples to rest. I think he not only rested there because it was convenient, but because Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were three of his closest friends. We don't often think about Jesus' personal relationships. Most often, it is the disciples that we think of and the way that he um, inspired them to follow, and the lessons that he taught, and the encouragement that he gave to each of them to find their own call, their own way of sharing God's love. And through connecting with disciples, we find our inspiration and our lessons and our encouragement to follow and act the way Jesus is calling us to. Today, though, I'd like to connect to his three friends and see what message they have for us particularly connecting to Mary. The shortest scripture passage in the Bible, in the Gospels anyway, is just two words long. It's Jesus wept. And it comes from an event with these three friends. Lazarus had fallen deathly ill, and Mary and Martha, his sisters, had sent for Jesus to come, but he didn't move quickly. And so Lazarus was in his tomb by the time he arrived. Jesus wept for himself, for Lazarus and the love that they shared, and he wept for the distress and grief of Mary and Martha. And then, and then he brought Lazarus back to life. Now it is just six days before Passover, and Jesus has returned to their home, and they have put on a meal for him. Martha did what she loved to do. She cooked and she served them and Lazarus ate with him and Mary, Mary was where Mary always was, at the feet of Jesus. They were gathered around a table again, but the scent of good food was overcome by the scent of controversy. As Mary opened a bottle of expensive perfume and began to anoint Jesus' feet, Jesus, Judas objected strenuously, complaining that the perfume should have been sold and the cash used to, for the ministry and mission to the poor. And, and that all sounds reasonable until you remember that it was Judas who con, con, 
controlled the purse strings for the group, and he was often skimming money for himself. Nard, the oil that Mary used to um, anoint Jesus' feet, is grown in the mountains of Nepal and, Japan, and China and India. The rhizomes, those are the uh, woody underground roots, are crushed and ground into a highly aromatic, amber, thick, essential oil. And then it's used as incense or perfume or a sedative or even an herbal medicine. Now Judas valued Mary's nard at 300 denarii, that is a year's wages. But she didn't use it sparingly. She poured it out extravagantly on Jesus' feet and mopped up the excess with her hair. This is an outrageously intimate act. Why would she do such a thing? Well, I think, firstly, she did it because she was profoundly grateful for Jesus for restoring her brother Lazarus to life. You know, last week we talked about the prodigal son, and we tuned in to the father's joy. The son that he thought was dead is now alive. The son that he thought was lost is now found. What joy, what love, and they had a huge celebration, and here we are at yet another celebratory dinner. Lazarus, who was dead, is now alive. And to show her gratitude and love, Mary poured out the nard that she had been saving on Jesus' feet. On his feet. You know, that we, we tend to read right past that little detail because we don't share the same culture. We don't live in the same time. Most often people were anointed on their heads. Like think of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He, he prepares a table in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. Only during a burial would someone begin from the feet and work up. So this points to the second reason for Mary's anointing. She was very aware of the fragility of human life. She had just experienced the death of her brother. She had grieved for four days before he was resuscitated. It was a miracle that he was now alive. And so she understood the finality of the physical presence of a loved one. It was so very real for her. Now the one that had given her brother life was approaching death. The one who brought everything to life was under threat. Crowds were coming to listen to his messages, but the government officials like Herod were frustrated with the loss of control over the crowds and over the chaos, and so they plotted to kill him. The religious leaders, too, they were afraid of his ability to heal and the radical message that he was interpreting from the Torah. And so when he brought Jesus, when he brought Lazarus back to life, they, too, began to plot his death. Mary was a devout disciple and a dear friend. She had listened and heard Jesus explain about his path forward. And she knew about the plots to kill him. She more clearly than the others knew and understood what was going to happen and she wouldn't let this moment pass without expressing her gratitude and her love. Now biblical interpreters talk about the symbolism of anointing. Jesus is the Christ, he is the Messiah, both words mean anointing. Anointing was used to set someone apart, to indicate that this is the one chosen by God for some special purpose. So priests and kings were anointed, and biblical interpreters will say that this anointing appoints to Jesus' priesthood, his kingship, and his divine purpose. And a good story does have a lot of symbolism and meaning built into it, but I think 
that Mary just simply adored the one who adored her. She wept at the thought of what was to come. She wept for her own loss, for, for his sacrifice. She loved the one that loved her, and in response, she poured out her all, her, her gratitude and joy, her sorrow and fear, her hope and her love, as she lavished that valuable nard onto Jesus' feet, onto his tired, dusty, earth-worn feet. And the room began to fill with the fragrance of her sacrifice. Each of us expresses our love for God, our Creator, and our love for Jesus, our Lord and Savior, and our love for the Spirit who brings us life in our own unique and authentic ways. Some of us are, are a lot like Martha. We love to serve people food. I'm thinking about people like Dot Wood and Dor Dolores Bowling. They show their love by cooking for us. There was just a meeting on Thursday to plan the senior luncheon, and the men met yesterday to plan out the Mother's Day meal, and you can all come for a bowl of soup when we gather for the Stations of the Cross at the community service on Friday. Pretty soon it's barbecue season, and Blair Smith and the Tongues of Fire are going to be cooking up some delicious mouth-watering meals. But the important part is that they use the funds that they raise to feed kids, to fill the weekend backpacks so that kids who are reliant on free and reduced school lunches have weekend food. And we're going to continue that program through the summer. It's, that one's called the Breakfast Club, and the meeting for that is on May the 1st at Mount Zion. Lazarus was one of the people at the table with Jesus, and he makes me think of those who pour out their love for Jesus in worship by being actively present. Bob and the Cantata Band have been practicing for months so that we get the message of Palm Passion Sunday in music. I'm so grateful for the devotion of the praise band and the fellowship choir, the trio, the bell ringers, the guitar players, the drummers, the organists, everyone who works so hard to pour out the music that brings us into the God's presence. Mary's act of anointing Jesus' feet was a humble, and unabashed generosity. It makes me think of those who pour out God's love through generous giving. Oh, I bet we don't, I don't often talk about this, but our congregation requires $35,000 each month to take care of the planned mission and ministries. That's $8,000 a week. When weather or illness messes with our worship, we take a hit to our budget line. Thankfully, a handful of generous givers have ensured that our needs have been met. Like, just think about February. That was a tough month. But five givers accounted for 24% of the donations. I, I, I'm totally grateful for each person's contribution. We can't, we can't be in ministry and mission to our neighbors if we don't all contribute. But I just want you to stop and think for a moment about that blessing of five families who carried us through February. Other people give their time. We have brand new floors in our education wing, brand clean, safe places for our children to learn and play. And that is because of Rita's Drive and Maryland's organization and the sweat of a lot of volunteers. Our Sunday schools are 
teachers are pouring themselves into our little ones and Jackie and other adults are pouring themselves into our youth. Quietly, without any need for recognition, people who love God are pour, have poured themselves out generously and sacrificially in much the same way that Mary sacrificed as she poured the expensive nard on Jesus' feet. Our church is filled with the fragrance of sacrificial love. Mary saw what Jesus needed and she acted. She didn't wait for a better day or a different place or a less costly method. She was inspired to express her love and gratitude, and so she did so right there in the midst of dinner. There's a life truth here for us. There are some things that we can do at just about any time, and there are other things that if we don't do it, if we don't seize the moment, they will never be done. Maybe you've had one of those impulses to act generously, to be big hearted, and then you it's like, I'll do that tomorrow, and then it never happened. Life is uncertain. If you feel moved to offer someone praise or thanksgiving or forgiveness, do it. Because they might not be there when you feel like it again. Often our failure to express an act in love leaves us with bitter remorse, and that just stinks. As we grow in our discipleship, may our Lord move and show each of us how to pour ourselves out so that the world is a sweeter place. Amen.